Good day. My name is Elizabeth Nosick, and I'm the Curator of Exhibits and Education at the Colorado Railroad Museum. For today's Small Wonder episode, we are focusing on some correspondence that was found in the museum's archival collection. These pages have quite a story to tell, and while they discuss the misplacement of a carload of buffalo bones by the railroad, scholars can not only gain a window into the part railroads played in the West's economic development and its 19th century attitudes toward Native Americans, but they also remind us of the very real impact Victorians' views had on the world that we inherited today. Before we start today's presentation, I should mention that while American bison is indeed the correct name for these majestic animals, for the purposes of this discussion, I will be using the terminology our correspondents used in 1897, buffalo. I also want to be sure I offered my sincere appreciation to Dr. Boxer, who is the Associate Professor of Native American and Indigenous Studies at the Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado. I want to thank her for sharing her knowledge and insight with me as I work to prepare today's presentation. Indigenous peoples had been hunting buffalo for hundreds of years when the first Europeans arrived in North America. For the native peoples of the plains, buffalo were arguably their single most important resource. By 1800, it was estimated that at least 30 million buffalo migrated throughout the Great Plains. For the Plains people, the buffalo provided them with food, shelter, tools, and clothing. Indeed, indigenous people's oral histories describe the ways in which two-legged and four-legged beings are intricately connected. Buffalo hunting was not done for sport, but so that people could live. The buffalo provided the indigenous peoples with far more than food. Buffalo hair was used for making ropes and pads, the horns and hoofs were made into implements and utensils, and the sinew was used for sewing and for making bowstrings, while the hides were used for clothing, blankets, and shelter. In fact, a typical lodge used buffalo hides, and it required 12 to 20 of them for its cover. Here in Colorado, buffalo were hunted by a diverse group of indigenous people, including the Cheyenne and Arapaho peoples, whose homelands included the northern and central plains, and the Comanche peoples, who lived in the southern plains, the Ute peoples who made annual hunting trips to the plains for buffalo. Bands of Pawnee peoples and other indigenous nations also traveled occasionally to Colorado's eastern plains in order to hunt the buffalo. These indigenous peoples utilized three main methods for hunting buffalo, the buffalo jump, the impound, and the horse. The buffalo jump consisted of luring buffalo to high cliffs. Once led to the jump site, the people would fan out in a V-shaped formation and wave blankets and ropes, startling the herd into a stampede over the cliff's edge. The impound technique was used when a cliff was not available. The native peoples would build a timber corral 10 to 15 feet high, with a chute about 100 yards out. Again, the hunters would drive the herd into a corral where the buffalo would be shot with arrows, unable to escape. After the acquisition of horses, hunters would use a bow and arrow or lance to shoot the buffalo from horseback. The bow and arrow was preferred, even after firearms were commonly available. This was for two reasons. One, it was difficult to reload a muzzle-loading gun at full gallop. And two, the hunter could easily reclaim the animals by looking at and identifying their own arrows. Whatever method was chosen, buffalo hunting was generally a communal undertaking, and care was given to ensure that elders and widows were provided for. All who aided in the butchering were entitled to a portion of the meat. Herd size was largely affected by predators, disease, fire, climate, competition from horses for grassland, the market, and other factors. Fires started by lightning strikes were not uncommon. They could sweep the grassland, sometimes maiming and killing buffaloes. Herds of horses competed for the prairie grasses. Drought was perhaps the most significant, being severe prior to the 15th century and episodic in the 18th. It is thought to have been at its worst at the very moment when other pressures converged on the buffalo between 1840 and 1880. 
However, the main impact on the buffalo's fate were Euro and Euro-American commodity markets for buffalo tongues, skins, meat, and robes, and the railroads which provided transportation to the rapidly expanding populations. Across the plains, thousands of buffaloes were killed every week. In 1867, the presence of the first of five railroads split the herd in the heart of the buffalo range, a process that was repeated again and again. The hides of these animals could fetch upwards to $10. Between 1867 and 1884, the harvest of buffalo was notable for the fury of the slaughter. Provisioners like Buffalo Bill Cody, sportsmen, farmers, and ranchers who craved the prairies for crops and cattle all placed new pressure on the buffalo. With the railroads making transportation of buffalo hides easy and cheap, market hunters flooded in, wasting three to five times the numbers they killed. The mass slaughter of herds already depleted by other factors defied description. Four to five million were killed in three years alone. Photographers documented the carnage. This photograph was taken by William Henry Jackson here in Colorado. The pace of the buffalo hunts was unsustainable and by the fall of 1883, commercial hunting was finished. Native peoples confined to reservations and distressed from hunger took part until the bitter end and in 1884, the final shipment of hides took place. With very few exceptions, the buffalo was gone and bone collectors began scooping up all the remains they could find for shipment east. You might think the story of the buffalo ended there. However, animal bones were useful things in the 19th century. Dried and charred, they produced a substance called bone black. When coarsely crushed, it could filter impurities out of sugarcane juice, leaving a clear liquid that evaporated to produce pure white sugar, a lucrative industry. Bone black also made a useful pigment for paints, dyes, and cosmetics, and acted as a dry lubricant for iron and steel forgings. Eastern industrialists also used the bones to make buttons and handles, as well as to manufacture fine china. Bone black was also widely used for fertilizer. As early as the 1870s and up through the 1890s, settlers in the areas could depend on bone picking for a source of income. If crops failed and cattle died, the one dependable source of income to remain was the bone trade. In fact, bone picking was the only thing that kept many newcomers from going hungry. In the late 1870s, bones brought from four to six dollars per ton. Through the years, the price of bones rose as the demand for them increased, and the bones became even harder to find. By the late 1890s, bone pickers received between $20 and $22 a ton. A successful bone trade depended on three factors, a ready source of bones, manufacturers who had a need for the bones, and transportation to get the bones from the west to the eastern markets. In the years before the turn of the last century, all three factors occurred, producing a profitable, although temporary, industry at just the right time for newcomers to the plains. It was the railroads who made it possible for the supply of bison bones to reach manufacturers by freighting the bones to distant railheads, now called boneheads. Which brings us to the 1887 correspondence between the office of Peter Robodeau of Beckelman, Nebraska, dealer in general merchandise, stockmen's and ranchmen's supplies, and Thomas Miller, general freight agent of the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad Company in Omaha, Nebraska. The two letters center on the loss of a car of buffalo bones that went missing in September of 1886. After a wait of some seven months, the Robodeau brothers demand $66.78 in payment for their loss. Mr. Miller replies on May 4th that the railroad has almost completed its investigation and hopes to get the matter fixed up at an early date. Now our records stop there and the questions did the railroad reimburse the Robodeau brothers for their loss or did they find the missing bones remain unanswered to this day. What we do know is that the buffalo bone trade was the result of overhunting, that it provided a new and important revenue stream for early pioneers, stimulated the freighting industry, and provided railroads with a commodity to fill their cars on the eastward journey. 
but it is also important to point out that this story is a cautionary tale of how easily our environment and those who live upon it can be damaged. While 19th century settlers prospered from the bone trade, indigenous people did not. In fact, the railroads and the United States military specifically targeted the buffalo because of the indigenous people's reliance upon buffalo for clothing, food, and shelter. In a letter General Sherman wrote to an officer dated May 10, 1868, he says, I think it would be wise to invite all the sportsmen of England and America there this fall for a grand buffalo hunt and make one grand sweep of them all. The planned extermination of the buffalo was indeed a crushing blow to native peoples. It did not, however, bring the final victory Sherman hoped for in his letter. The combined actions of the bone traders, railroads, and those who bought the resulting goods decimated the buffalo herds in North America. Finally, only a few hundred wild buffalo remained in the country's new national park, Yellowstone. Today, over 130 years later, the buffalo have returned from the brink of extinction to roam the grasslands again in Yellowstone and beyond. While nowhere near the 30 million that once populated the plains of North America, Yellowstone and many tribal nations today are returning bison to their tribal homelands. Today, some 20 to 25,000 remain in public herds. In fact, here in the Denver metro area, Denver Parks and Recreation maintain two conservation herds, one at Genesee Park and another at Daniels Park. The two herds were descended from the last wild bison in North America and were originally established at the Denver City Park by the Zoo and City of Denver. They were moved to Genesee in 1914 and expanded to Daniels Park in 1938. Now, in 2021, the city and county of Denver continues its role as a leader in bison conservation by working with partners to build and enhance conservation herds on tribal lands. As you see, every object has a story to tell. And I encourage you to join us at the Colorado Railroad Museum as we continue to seek a better understanding of the railroad's role in Colorado's history through those objects. Like, comment, share, and subscribe. Commenting and sharing in particular may qualify as virtual engagements for important funding programs like the SCFD.